We're not going to talk about compressible flow in this class, but we are going to cover compressibility in the Mach number because it does, it does affect the coefficient of drag. We assess compressibility with the Mach number. This is another dimensionless number, and it's the velocity of the object divided by the speed of sound. It may seem strange to be using the speed of sound to assess compressibility, but it, if you think about it, sound is the result of compression of the airfield or the, the fluid field around you. So sound is a very good um, measure for uh, compressibility. For the Mach number, um, keep in mind you can use the Mach number not just as a dimensionless number but as a, um, a unit for velocity. So you could say you know that aircraft is traveling at Mach 2 and that gives you some indication as to how fast it's moving. The Mach number does vary depending on atmospheric conditions so um, it's not an exact number of velocity but it's it's very useful. Also note that since compressibility is a function of the speed of sound, we really don't have to worry about compressible effects unless we're traveling very, very fast, traveling near the speed of sound. So the Mach number is the ratio of the velocity over the speed of sound. You can calculate the speed of sound in gases using this equation, and it uses the gas constant and the heat ratio. The heat ratio we haven't used yet, but you can look that up on tables in your textbook. And temperature, when you use temperature in here, keep in mind it has to be in degrees Kelvin or degrees Rankine to be consistent with the gas constant. You can also calculate the speed of sound in liquids, and you use a different equation. This relies on the bulk modulus of elasticity for the fluid, and that's also something you can look up. And the speed of sound at, in air at standard temperature and pressure is 346 meters per second, while in water it's over four times as fast. And so as you know, speed uh, sound travels much faster in water than in air. Now let's imagine we're traveling at half the speed of sound. And we're going to be emitting noise periodically. So let's say we emit one beep initially. So what happens is we, we make this sphere of compressed air around us which expands as at the speed of sound as it travels away from us. So we have this expanding sphere and then we move a little bit and we make another noise. That creates a new sphere which is expanding within that out that other sphere but it doesn't have the same center as the previous one because we've moved. And if we keep moving this and making noises, what happens is we get these expanding spheres of sound, but in the direction we're traveling, they're compressed, and in the direction we came from, they're expanded. In waves, what this means is we get a lower frequency behind us and a higher frequency in front of us. And if we think about sound, that means we have a lower pitch behind us and a higher pitch in front of us. And you can experience this, you experience this all the time as, as cars pass you. Um, if you think about a car traveling at fairly high speed, as long as it's not accelerating or decelerating, it's emitting noise at pretty much a constant pitch. But if you're on the side of the road, watching this car approach you and then pass you, it sounds like the pitch is higher as it's coming towards you. And then once it passes you and is traveling away, away from you, it, it, the, the sound uh, changes to a lower pitch. We call that the Doppler effect. Now what happens if we travel at Mach 1? That is, if we're traveling right at the speed of sound. So we emit a sound, and that creates this sphere of compressed air that expands around us. And then a little bit later, we emit, we emit another sound. That, but we've moved, and we've moved with the previous sound wave. So this next sound is emitted right on top of the old one and so on. That continues. And what happens 
is we get these sound waves stacking up right on top of one another. <clears throat> if you remember wave studying waves in physics, this is called constructive interference, and it results in an increase in amplitude. And if you increase the amplitude of sound, that means your noise is getting louder and louder. We call this the son a sonic boom. And it can be really, really loud. I mean, it can be so loud that there are ordinances that, that restrict supersonic, su supersonic flight around developed areas. The sonic boom can be so loud that it can shatter windows or cause structural damage on buildings. <clears throat> now, of course, any observer in front of this aircraft that's traveling at the speed of sound will not be able to hear anything because the sound waves can't travel in front of the object. So you get this zone of silence and you don't hear the object until that sonic boom sweeps past you. Now, if we're traveling at, at greater than Mach 1, the same thing happens. We emit noise and we get these spheres of compressed air traveling around us. But the second sphere is emitted in front of the first sphere. So we're traveling outside those sound waves. And when you overlay these sound waves on top of each other, what you get is this cone of sound sweeping along behind you. This is called a mock cone. And if you were an observer on the ground, that you, I'm sure you've seen this before, a jet will pass overhead and you won't hear it, you won't hear it, and then all of a sudden, a couple seconds later, you'll hear it. Um, using the Mach number, we can relate the geometry of this Mach cone. So the angle created is, or the sign of the angle created is one over the Mach number. Here's a picture of an aircraft that's breaking the sound barrier. And what's happening here is it's generating a cloud around it. Now, we talked about the sonic boom being a great increase in amplitude. This also results in really high pressures. And that high pressure um, causes water to condense in the air. So let's think about water in the air for a minute. Water vapor is in the air um, and it's invisible when it's in the, when it's in the gaseous form but when it condenses into a liquid we call that a cloud so clouds are liquid water they're tiny little droplets that are suspended up in the air but it is liquid water so in this case we've increased the pressure just in that small region around the aircraft because of the sonic boom and if that pressure is greater than the vapor pressure of the water, it will form a cloud. Also look at where the cloud is forming. Those, those shock waves from the sonic boom tend to occur right behind the wing, but also you can see a little cloud forming right, right behind the cockpit. So the, the lines of a supersonic aircraft have a big impact on its drag. Streamlining is, is critical on, on these types of aircraft. There's some terminology you should know about Mach numbers. If you're below a Mach number of 0.3 or around 0.3, we can consider the air to behave incompressibly. So we did this with the Bernoulli equation, right? The Bernoulli equation has an incompressible assumption, but we were able to use it with gases. The only catch is when you get up to really high velocities. When you get up close to the Mach number, then the fluid starts to behave very strangely and things get very very complicated. So as long as we're at low velocities, less than 0.3 Mach, then um, you, we can assume it's behaving incompressibly. If we're below Mach 1, that's called subsonic flow. Above Mach 1 is supersonic flow. As you cross over, that's called transonic flow. And then we've we've created aircraft now that travel really, really fast, and we've just assigned above Mach 5, we've called these type aircraft hypersonic for whatever reason. So let's do an example. Let's say you are on the ground and you see a jet pass overhead, 
and it's traveling at 10,000 feet. And it's not until eight seconds after it passes that you finally hear it. So what velocity is that aircraft traveling? Now we can do a few things here just using trigonometry. Oh, and let's assume the temperature of the atmosphere is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So using trigonometry, the angle between you and the jet when you first hear it is simply the tangent of that angle is 10,000 feet divided by the distance that aircraft traveled. Now it's traveled for eight seconds, so we can relate that to velocity. So we come up with this equation. We've got two unknowns. We've got the angle and the velocity. We can also use that mach cone equation. But first, let's figure out what the speed of sound is. So I looked up the ideal gas constant and the heat ratio for air. And 40 degrees Fahrenheit is 500 degrees Rankine. And I get a speed of sound of over 1,000 feet per second. Now using that mach cone equation, I can then come up with a second equation that relates alpha and velocity. Okay, so that's the fluids part of this. We've got a little trigonometry we can do, and then there's that mach cone equation. Now the rest of this is just math. We have two equations, two unknowns. It's a little tricky to solve because we've got um, sines and tangents. I'm going to replace tangent with sine over cosine. And then when I plug in that second equation in here, I get rid of the velocity, and I'm able to cancel out the signs. So then it's just a matter of solving for alpha, which turns out to be 28.7 degrees, and then plugging back into either of those initial equations. And I get a velocity of 2,283 feet per second or a Mach number of 2.08.